Well, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for some of the moms that came out here. I see a number of them out in the back. Uh, it's not exactly the perfect day, but it is the bold north after all. So, uh, the, uh, Kurt Dowd and I both want to talk about something that we want to do and, and make a, a commitment to Minnesota, and it's about opening up Minnesota, a contract to open Minnesota up. Uh, as you know, uh, many kids are not in school. I think about 50% of kids, uh, because of the metrics that the governor has uh, set forth, there's no way that they can actually be in the classroom. And we think that it's absolutely essential that kids are in school. Uh, there are some that can do distance learning, but a lot of kids don't do well with that. And so this contract really focuses on getting kids back in school, uh, the sports and all the other activities that they want to do, that they get to participate in those because that's a, uh, an important part of education, and that the parents and families get to go to those events to watch them and enjoy what they're doing. It's part of the experience, it's part of their development as kids. You can't just wipe out a school year and then suddenly say, well, we're, you're, you're going to be okay. They have to be in there. And I don't know if you know, but there's a recent report out that came out today out of New York that they randomly tested over 10,000 people in the school district, 10,000, and you had 13 faculty members that had the virus and five students. So it is not a super spreader. That's the really good news is we know now following the science that it's not a super spreader, so we gotta get the kids back in school. Uh, and if you know, if you think about this, we've now had this pandemic for nine months. Nine months of, of looking at the data, watching what it's doing for, for our, uh, our communities and how it's affecting it. We know now what to do. We, we know what to do. We've got the, the, the PPP, we've got that in place. It's already here, we're already ready. That, what the governor even said in late April, we've got it. We know that we have that, those uh, resources available. We know that we have enough beds, uh, ICU beds. Even though they only say that there's 1,800 is the number I see that they use now, back in April it was, there was the ability within 72 hours to have 3,000 beds. And so we have the capacity now to do what we need to do, and we see the science that shows that people need to be back in the school. So um, if, you, if you look at the thing that we gave you, there's five points. Every Minnesota, every Minnesota student deserves a quality education. It's absolutely essential for them that they have that. that and the, for most of them, it's kids in school. Number two, every Minnesota student has the right to participate in the activities that are available in school. Number three, uh, the parents and the friends get to go to those activities. That's part of the experience that they benefit from. Four is that we want to make sure that people are able to go to their places of worship. We think that that's important uh, for many, many, many people in Minnesota. And five, restaurants and other venues need to be open and figure out what, how do they open, how do they do this safely. Every one of these we believe we can do safely, but as we think about it, think about the fact that we now trust Minnesotans to look at the data, look at the science, follow the CDC guidelines, and live their lives in all of these different areas. And so that's why we have this commitment. Well, why is it important for this, for Kurt, I keep wanting to call him speaker because that's the goal, but why, why is it important that Kurt and I come out here today? It's because there's only one way that we can make sure that these happen, and that is for Republicans to keep the majority in the Senate and Republicans to take back the majority in the, in the House. Because when that happens, uh, uh, Representative Doubt and myself are committed to saying, Governor, your emergency powers go away, and now we work together. Because that's how it always works best in Minnesota, is when the legislative branch is working together with the governor. That, that's how you get the best policy, you get the best decisions when we're working together. So we're committed to those five principles, but also that we would remove the governor's emergency powers so that we could, again, get back to that place of, of Minnesota working together. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Representative Doubt, and then we have uh, Senator Scott Jensen, who's also a doctor, to give some more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, and thank you uh, to the members of the press and the public who are here. You know, obviously, we feel very strongly about uh, every Minnesota student's right to be in a classroom. Um, I think we can all agree that uh, students get the best education when they're in a classroom with a teacher. Uh, we do understand there may be exceptions to that, but unfortunately under the governor's current plan, um, his default is 
uh, a virtual uh, distance learning situation. Um, and with the challenges that many of our students face uh, in their homes, in their communities, uh, with lack of internet and lack of resources, uh, parents are not teachers. Um, and they cannot be uh, expected to uh, you know, educate their kids in the same way that we're paying teachers to do. Uh, our teachers are every bit as essential as our frontline workers, um, as our waiters and waitresses, and the many other people who in Minnesota are considered essential. Um, we believe the default in the state should be every student should have a right to be in a classroom. Um, and that's what how we would change this policy uh, to make sure that kids have that, that opportunity. Um, we're getting text messages and calls from parents all across the state of Minnesota every day uh, who are complaining about their, uh, their students who normally excel in the classroom and who normally uh, achieve uh, great grades. And um, they're very concerned that their kids are falling behind and they're not learning the material uh, in the same way that they can if they're in a classroom. So. Um, you know, we think it's it's very important. We think it's vital, and we uh, we believe in the fundamental right of every student uh, to be in a classroom. Um, there have been uh, recent articles touting that 95% attendance rate for distance learning. Um, this is not something, you know, that sounds great, right? 95% of kids are participating in distance learning. If that's the statistic statewide, that means there's 50,000 kids who are unaccounted for, who are not participating in distance learning. The best thing that we can give our kids is an education to prepare them for this world and make sure that, uh, that they have the tools that they need to be successful. We need to make sure that we get our kids back into the classrooms where they can learn. And we can do that safely and, and, and school districts uh, know how to do that. We're also concerned about the, the, uh, the rise in, in mental health issues related to isolation, loneliness, and, and not being uh, involved in their schools and in their normal, uh, their normal activities. And we're seeing that rise both among children and adults. Um, we trust our parents and our school boards, we trust our city councils and our local communities uh, to keep our citizens and our, and our kids safe. Um, and we trust them to make those decisions. Um, Democrats, unfortunately, just want one person. They want Governor Walls to make all the decisions. Um, and, and I think you can see the flaws in, in his plans. This doesn't mean that we don't take uh, COVID seriously. We absolutely do. Uh, but we also know that COVID is going to be here for a while and we can't uh, continue to, to, to stop our lives and stop our, our activities and just wait it out. We have to learn how to live with COVID and we can do that safely. We've learned it over the last nine months. In addition, uh, you know, I think you can see uh, uh, some of the faults in, in Walls' policy in, in, uh, at the sporting events where, you know, schools have shown pictures of their stands where uh, Governor Walls will only allow 250, uh, 250 uh, spectators in a, in a football stadium that will hold 4,000 people. Um, I, I just think his, his policies are unreasonable um, and I don't know if he's getting pressure from uh, the teachers union or other places to default to a, a distance learning model. I think we've been, if you will, insulated from the reality of how fragile life is. And I think what parents are saying is we don't get to walk this one back. We don't get to get a mulligan. We're touching kids' lives forever. If we could just sort of focus on five entities that I see between for kids that between 5 and 15 I see autism when you think of autism don't you think of someone who's more rigidly aligned with what their environment looks like that's what autism is these are people who have lost the flexibility to deal with what's happening in the here and now around them. we are going to see an increase in autism that's a given we know that we're seeing an increase in abuse because frankly it's the teachers and a lot of those settings where abuse is generally reported. We know that the anxiety is ramping up, we know depression's ramping up, and if, if we just look at the statistics for suicide, we know that that's ramping up and we're talking about suicide at a younger age. Folks, we don't get to step this one back. This is forever. And so if you see parents passionately saying, why are you doing this to me? Because if I was raising a five-year-old or a 10-year-old, I'd be asking that same question. These are not people who aren't concerned about grandma. These are not pe people who want to do something wrong. They just want to say, let's keep it in perspective. We have seen this shifting goalposts for the last seven months. It started out that we needed to flatten the curve so that we could make certain that our hospital facilities weren't overwhelmed. 
Well, we're seeing the same thing a month ago when we were told, we can't have kids back in school, they're super spreaders. Well, no, they aren't. The New York Times came out a week and a half ago and said, that's not being proven. And the Atlantic Monthly came out and said the same thing. That was probably over magnified. When we started talking about Kawasaki's disease about four months ago, about see what's happening to the kids that are getting COVID. That didn't bear out. We're just leaping from one thing to another, just like a game of whack-a-mole. And we're letting the fear just drive our actions. And for our kids, it's not fair. And my last thing I'd say is, when I talk to my 85 and my 90-year-old patients, and I've got one, one gal who she's 103, and she's telling me, she said, Doc, I hope you aren't doing these things for me because I've had the gift of living a full life. What's killing me is watching me not be able to hug my grandchild or my great-grandchild or seeing my great-grandchild not be able to experience the fullness of their senior year in high school. Who are we? That's what the parents are asking us. Who are we? And I think every one of us ought to spend some time thinking about that. Thank you for coming out. So we're, we are hopeful. Uh, we, we know that Minnesota would benefit from opening up the schools, and we're, we're, uh, we, we think this is the direction that we should go. Uh, that's why we wanted to form it in the frame of a contract that we are committed to it. Uh, the data is more and more coming out showing that same thing. And so with that, we're going to keep moving forward. But if Republicans win the House and the Senate, the governor's emergency powers are removed and we can move this direction. So with that, we'll take any questions. Senator, any concern about announcing this contract at a time when cases are, uh, there's an uptick both in the raw numbers and the positivity rate, and also the fact that the governor's approval rate of having the coronavirus fall down from its peak in March and April is still over 50 percent. Any concern about those two things? So we're not measuring approval ratings for the decisions that we make, and I, I look back all the way through October at the number of deaths per day because I think it's that's when we look at how many people uh, tragically lose their life from this that's what I want to know and frankly in the last five days there's been two of those days where they've been at, at five deaths which is for this virus this pandemic is a low number and so we've been testing a lot more and if you test a lot more you're going to get a lot more people to have the virus but as we follow the number of people that need the beds and the number of people that are dying, those are the ones that we really can see where are we and what kind of action do we need to take. And so that's why I gave that report from New York to say, look, in schools, they're not getting the virus and they're not spreading the virus. And so that's the main thing we want people to realize is our kids don't get a second chance at education. You can't just give them an A because they showed up. They need to learn. And if we take that school year away from them, uh, it, it hurts us all and it hurts their future. We think that if kids are not in school, we all suffer. That's not a poll. That's just talking to people and mothers reaching out to us and, and, and just very frustrated that their kids cannot be in school or that they cannot go to a game to watch their kids play in some event. And you know how it is if you've ever played sports, you're looking out, in, out into the, the audience to see if your mom and dad are there cheering you on. And we're limiting all of those types of things. But we know if they're not in school, they're suffering. And we know that uh, some of the communities of color, their kids are falling farther behind. We already were failing with our kids in some of the schools in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and this has only made that worse. And so we're just saying, this is the right thing to do for Minnesota. I don't, if there's a poll that says it's good or bad, I'm not sure, but the people I listen to, the parents that are speaking out to us are very frustrated that, ca that they can't have their kids in school. There is about 15% of students I've been told that don't want to be in the classroom, or parents or students, and we can allow them to have distance learning and we can allow teach align teachers that don't want to be in the classroom with those. But the, the vast majority of kids want to be in school and need to be in school. So would this be up to the given school board or district to decide the school? Can tell us a little bit more about some of the specifics that have changed? Like perhaps, I think you went to three weeks at six and a half weeks. Yeah, we would rather the school districts uh, and school boards make the decisions. We think that they know what's best for, for the kids in their schools. The metrics that the governor set in place basically forced 
uh, schools to close their high schools. That's, that's the problem is they made it so difficult that they can't be in school when they have to distance six feet. I know American, American Pediatrics said that three feet would work and so we've got to find ways through it but I trust the local schools and their school boards to make the decisions. Uh, Dr. Jensen, yep. can you summarize the obstacles? Uh, in the last nine months, we were told to listen to science and doctors, but we've seen a lot of doctors squelch, especially you, which has made us very sad. We love how you've been at the front lines of trying to share wisdom as a doctor. Can you summarize these last nine months, the trouble you've had getting the word out, where you, where doctors, some doctors, where they're at? It's ironic that you asked that question today because the Star Tribune's editorial position spoke to that issue as to what's happening with COVID-19 in our world. And they spoke specifically of government actors using this pandemic to squelch voices, censor, expand powers, and if you will, circumvent normal legislative processes. So I would never have chosen this path to walk, but I think whatever path you're on, I think you just have to do the best you can walking. So that's what I'm gonna do. I think it's noteworthy that in the middle of the 2009 swine flu pandemic, Dr. Mike Osterholm and the doctor with the CDC leading the influenza portion of the CDC's business came out in the middle of the summer and they said, testing is virtually meaningless. We have to focus on hospitalizations, overstressing our capabilities and the fatality rate. We're at that same point today, folks. We have had more doubts and questions about the PCR testing when you run it cycling it 40 to 45 times. We have people across the country asking about that. Now we have the antigen test, which can give us our results in three or four hours. But when we get a negative antigen test, we're not allowed to take that as a negative. We have to follow that up with a positive. But if it's a positive antigen test, we can take that as a positive. Do you see what's happening? When what we really have to do is we have to say, tests can help guide us perhaps more in focused, pocketed sensations if we're gonna see a business or we're gonna see a school. But the big breath has gotta be, what are the goalposts? What are we trying to accomplish? And if we're trying to reduce the inequities with learning, then when 75% of our minority kids are not accessing the internet every day for this distance learning, then how can we expect anything other than increased disparities? We're not doing the right thing. We're going the wrong direction. Where are we going to get our liberty back? Uh, I think it might be sweet. <laughs> uh, we want to thank you for your bravery these last nine months. You've been out front, very brave. And I, I still can't figure out why literally millions of non-doctors, non-scientists would squelch doctors and scientists. So we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got a question. I'll be here. Go ahead. I got a question for either of you. Well, you uh, uh, the lawmaker in, in your pocket has acknowledged that COVID is not a winning issue for Republicans. I'm wondering that combined with the fact that President Trump is pulling out stakes uh, here in Minnesota with TV ads. Uh, I'm wondering, isn't the public against you on this issue? You know, uh, again, I think Senator Gazelka kind of answered that question. We're not looking at polling whether uh, COVID is a political issue. We don't believe that a virus is a political issue. Uh, we want to do the things that that science would direct us to do. Um, I'll remind you that that uh, Governor Walls at the very beginning of this uh, listened to scientists who told them we would have uh, somewhere between on the low end 20 or 30,000 deaths up to 78,000 deaths. Um, and he put in place uh, very arduous restrictions on our businesses, on our schools, on uh, on, on everyone, on, on Minnesota families. Um, and he really hasn't adjusted to what science has learned about this virus. Um, what we want to do is make sure that we actually respond to what we're seeing in the body of evidence and, that, and the data that's in front of us about the fact that kids are not transmitting, that they're not uh, they're not infected and they're not transmitting this virus in any uh, large numbers in the school situations that they've been in really anywhere across the country. Um, we have not lost a school-aged child to COVID in the state of Minnesota. Um, data will show you that they, they do not, their infection rate is much, much lower. Um, and, and because they're not infecting, they're also not transmitting. But we also know what to do if somebody does get infected, right? Um, even if they're exposed to somebody who's infected, we know to quarantine. I had to quarantine for 14 days 
days recently. I've done it twice now. Um, and, and you know, we all know that we can do that as our part if we need to, but we don't need to quarantine when we don't need to, right? Kids deserve to have that access to their schools, to their teachers in a classroom where they can be most successful. And, and we think that that issue itself transcends politics. Um, and if Democrats want to make politics out of COVID, knock yourselves out. We care about keeping people safe and letting people live their lives while we keep them safe. That's what's important. You know, those things aren't covered in our contract. We want to make sure that kids have access to schools, that restaurants can make decisions to open up and, and they can make decisions to keep their customers safe. We want to make sure local school districts have the ability to make decisions about how many people they can keep safe in the stands in their football stadium. Um, and, and, you know, we want to make sure that people have their right to, to worship in person. Um, these are things that we think are fundamental rights and, and we want to make sure that Minnesotans have access to those rights. Later, in, in a couple of weeks, voters decide not to return to your office and not to leave control of the Senator Delta. What happens in terms of, where do you see things going with Governor Walls in terms of opening up Minnesota? You know, I don't know uh, what Governor Walls would do in a in one party control where his, his party was in control. What I do know is that Minnesotans uh, appreciate and we have a long history of divided government. Um, I don't think Minnesotans want uh, Governor Walls to have complete control uh, of the state. And, and while we wish he would have worked with us over the last nine months, he has chosen uh, not to work with us and to, to go his own with his emergency powers. We think that's unfortunate. We know that Minnesotans uh, appreciate uh, when we work together and we know that we do a better job when we all work together. That's been our only uh, ask of the governor for the last nine months. And, and he has uh, really time and time again refused to work with us. I have a list of things um, as long as my arm of things that I've asked the administration for, just basic numbers about how much money is left in this account or that COVID account. Um, and, and they just refuse to answer the questions. And, and I, I, you know, he, he needs to step up and, and be the leader, I think, that, that he thinks he is. Um, he needs to live up to that and, and he needs to actually work with the legislature. Um, it, it's all of us that, that get to serve the Minnesotans uh, together and, and we're ready and eager and willing to do that. Senator, Thank go ahead. You. Yeah, I think that's an important question uh, because if you go back to the last time the Republicans had the House, Senate, and the governor, we had a surplus and they still raised taxes, $2 billion. So now if we have a 4 or $5 billion budget shortfall, what are their solutions going to be? But I truly believe that the, the Senate Republicans will keep the majority and the House will come back to Republicans because I think people want us to work together. I think that's an important issue and I think they want their kids back in school and life uh, managed through COVID, but trying to live as normal as possible. What's up? So the contract to open up Minnesota really is about taking away the governor's emergency power so that the legislative branch works with the governor. Uh, which means then the governor cannot force businesses to close, churches to close, kids not to be in school. It's really more of Minnesotans working together, trusting each other, following the CDC guidelines, and learning to the, live their lives with COVID, just like we did with N1, H1, and all the other serious viruses. So talk about the practicality, though, of, of trying to win back the house. Yep. Yes. And are you concerned about some of the data that shows that a lot of the mail-in votes are coming, the Democrats are voting early, Republicans aren't? Republicans always vote late, but I, I am comfortable with where we're at right now. I think uh, every election you got to wait till the end to see, but I feel good about the candidates both in the House and Senate. Tim. You keep referring to this as a contract. Is it in written form? I haven't seen it. I, I believe we had a sheet that we released to everybody, but if you did Email. It's in your email, Tim. Check your mail. No. Leader Gazelka, you sent a letter to Governor Walls asking him for the metrics, uh, the data. What was you wanted to know what the governor was looking for and ordered a future plan for turning his dials down and opening up our state. One, did he ever respond to you with any information? And two. Is there anything preventing the governor from running special sessions all the way through next summer if the Republicans do not take the House? 
So I'll take the questions. Normally I just take them from the reporters, but they're very, very good questions. I, I did ask the uh, the governor what are what are the the goalposts uh, to get us out of these emergency powers, and and frankly, I've never gotten an answer back on those. Uh, all we've seen is the goalposts move, and so uh, as long as he keeps emergency powers, every 30 days we have to have a special session, which he calls us back to. Uh, and that will uh, continue until we get to session in January and then there are no special sessions. But, uh, and then next year we have the budget which will be extremely difficult and we know that it's important for Minnesota that we figure out how to work together. We're divided government and we're going to have to pa uh, pass a, and balance a budget unlike the federal government. And I am committed, I know that uh, Representative Doubt is committed to, to do our part to do that. Uh, but it's going to be very serious, which is why we've been asking the governor to cut spending 5% all the way back to last April, because we would have saved $100 million a month had we done that, and we're going to need that money coming into next year. So, so nothing restricts emergency powers from continuing no. well into next year without the House? Correct. Can you One, speak to the restaurant restrictions, please? Uh, would you just open everything up and let the restaurant owner decide what it looks like inside there? Yes, uh, let the owners and the public decide because people can right now decide whether it's wise to go into a particular establishment or not. Uh, we do think that wearing masks, washing your hands, uh, covering your cough, staying at home if you're sick are all really wise to do. And uh, we think that, that we trust the people of Minnesota to, to keep safe and to keep others safe. Uh, and that's that's the distinction that we would draw. Uh, there are there are roughly 40 percent of the hospitality industry, according to their reports, say that they may actually go out of business. And anybody that's been around Minneapolis and St. Paul knows that a lot of these longtime establishments are gone because we we chose the governor chose to shut them down and not give them a chance. And so we think the public is smart enough to know when to go into an establishment or not and that business owner knows what it's going to take to survive or not. And so it's, it's, uh, it's one of those areas that we know there is some risk, uh, but we think the, that keeping our economy going is also very, very important for what we're doing. Well, what, I think we'll wrap it up with that. Because the question for Leader Dowd off topic. Okay. Uh, could you comment on your candidate, Donald Rowley, and these cartoons that the DFL is circulating? Sure, I just you know saw it very briefly, but um, you know it's my understanding that this was not done by him. It was something his brother did as satire years ago. His brother is apparently a professional illustrator uh, now, so um, doesn't you know it was not it was not that candidate. But obviously they were distasteful and inappropriate. So did you talk to him? I have not. So thank you so, all. We're yeah, thank you all. Hold it on, so thank you.